Welcome to this video about the RMS Lusitania, one of the most iconic and tragic ocean liners of the early 20th century. Launched in 1906, the Lusitania was a marvel of modern engineering, renowned for its size, speed, and luxury. However, its fate was sealed on May 7, 1915, when it was torpedoed by a German U-boat off the coast of Ireland, resulting in the loss of over 1,000 lives. Join us as we explore the fascinating history of the Lusitania from its construction to its ill-fated final voyage and examine the events that led to one of the most controversial incidents of the First World War. When Lusitania was built, her construction and operating expenses were subsidized by the British government, with the provision that she could be converted to an armed merchant cruiser if need be. At the outbreak of the First World War, the British Admiralty considered her for requisition as an armed merchant cruiser, and she was put on the official list of AMCs. The Admiralty then cancelled their earlier decision and decided not to use her as an AMC after all. Large liners such as Lusitania consumed enormous quantities of coal, 910 tons per day, or 37.6 tons per hour, and became a serious drain on the Admiralty's fuel reserves. So express liners were deemed inappropriate for the role when smaller cruisers would do. They were also very distinctive, so smaller liners were used as transports instead. Lusitania remained on the official AMC list and was listed as an auxiliary cruiser in the 1914 edition of Jane's All the World's Fighting Ships, along with Mauritania. At the outbreak of hostilities, fears for the safety of Lusitania and other great liners ran high. During the ship's first eastbound crossing after the war started, she was painted in a drab gray color scheme in an attempt to mask her identity and make her more difficult to detect visually. When it turned out that the German Navy was kept in check by the Royal Navy, and their commerce threat almost entirely evaporated, it very soon seemed that the Atlantic was safe for ships like Lusitania, if the bookings justified the expense of keeping them in service. Many of the large liners were laid up over the autumn and winter of 1914, in part due to falling demand for passenger travel across the Atlantic, and in part to protect them from damage due to mines or other dangers. Among the most recognizable of these liners, some were eventually used as troop transports, while others became hospital ships. Lusitania remained in commercial service. Although bookings aboard her were by no means strong during that autumn and winter, Demand was strong enough to keep her in civilian service. Economizing measures were taken, however. One of these was the shutting down of her number four boiler room to conserve coal and crew costs. This reduced her maximum speed from over 25 to 21 knots. Even so, she was the fastest first-class passenger liner left in commercial service. With apparent dangers evaporating, the ship's disguised paint scheme was also dropped and she was returned to civilian colors. Her name was picked out in gilt, her funnels were repainted in their usual canard livery, and her superstructure was painted white again. One alteration was the addition of a bronze gold-colored band around the base of the superstructure just above the black paint. The British established a naval blockade of Germany on the outbreak of war in August 1914, issuing a comprehensive list of contraband that included even foodstuffs, and in early November 1914 Britain declared the North Sea to be a war zone, with any ships entering the North Sea doing so at their own risk. By early 1915, a new threat to British shipping began to materialize, U-boats. At first, the Germans used them only to attack naval vessels, and they achieved only occasional, but sometimes spectacular, successes. U-boats then began to attack merchant vessels at times, although almost always in accordance with the old cruiser rules. Desperate to gain an advantage on the Atlantic, the German government decided to step up its submarine campaign. On the 4th of February 1915, Germany declared the seas around the British Isles a war zone. From the 18th of February, Allied ships in the area would be sunk without warning. This was not wholly unrestricted submarine warfare, since efforts would be taken to avoid sinking neutral ships. Lusitania was scheduled to arrive in Liverpool on the 6th of March, 1915. The Admiralty issued her specific instructions on how to avoid submarines. Despite a severe shortage of destroyers, Admiral Henry Oliver ordered HMS Lewis and Laverock to escort Lusitania, 
and took the further precaution of sending the Q-ship Lions to patrol Liverpool Bay. One of the destroyer's commanders attempted to discover the whereabouts of Lusitania by telephoning Cunard, who refused to give out any information and referred him to the Admiralty. At sea, the ships contacted Lusitania by radio, but did not have the codes used to communicate with merchant ships. Captain Daniel Dow of Lusitania refused to give his own position except in code, and since he was, in any case, some distance from the positions he gave, continued to Liverpool unescorted. It seems that in response to this new submarine threat, some alterations were made to Lusitania and her operation. She was ordered not to fly any flags in the war zone. A number of warnings plus advice were sent to the ship's commander to help him decide how to best protect his ship against the new threat, and it also seems that her funnels were most likely painted a dark gray to help make her less visible to enemy submarines. There was no hope of disguising her actual identity, since her profile was so well known, and no attempt was made to paint out the ship's name at the prow. Captain Dow, apparently suffering from stress from operating his ship in the war zone, and after a significant false flag controversy left the ship, Cunard later explained that he was tired and really ill. He was replaced with a new commander, Captain William Thomas Turner, who had commanded Lusitania, Mauritania, and Aquitania in the years before the war. On the 17th of April, 1915, Lusitania left Liverpool on her 201st transatlantic voyage, arriving in New York on the 24th of April. A group of German Americans, hoping to avoid controversy if Lusitania were attacked by a U-boat, discussed their concerns with a representative of the German embassy. The embassy decided to warn passengers before her next crossing not to sail aboard Lusitania, and on the 22nd of April placed a warning advertisement in 50 American newspapers, including those in New York. Notice. Travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies and Great Britain and her allies, that the zone of war includes the waters adjacent to the British Isles, that, in accordance with formal notice given by the Imperial German government, vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or any of her allies are liable to destruction in those waters, and that travelers sailing in the war zone on the ships of Great Britain or her allies do so at their own risk. Imperial German Embassy, Washington, D.C., the 22nd of April, 1915. This warning was printed adjacent to an advertisement for Lusitania's return voyage. The warning led to some agitation in the press and worried the ship's passengers and crew. While many British passenger ships had been called into duty for the war effort, Lusitania remained on her regular route between Liverpool and New York City. She departed Pier 54 in New York on the 1st of May 1915 on her return trip to Liverpool with 1,959 people aboard. In addition to her crew of 694, she carried 1,265 passengers, mostly British nationals as well as a large number of Canadians along with 159 Americans. Her first-class accommodations, for which she was well regarded on the North Atlantic run, were booked at just over half capacity at 290. Second class was severely overbooked with 601 passengers, far exceeding the maximum capacity of 460, while a large number of small children and infants helped reduce the squeeze into the limited number of two and four berth cabins, the situation was rectified by allowing some second-class passengers to occupy empty first-class cabins. In third class, the situation was considered to be the norm for an eastbound crossing, with only 373 traveling in accommodations designed for 1,186. Captain Turner, known as Bowler Bill for his favorite shoreside headgear, had returned to his old command of Lusitania. He was Commodore of the Cunard Line and a highly experienced Master Mariner, and had relieved Daniel Dow, the ship's regular captain. Dow had been instructed by his chairman, Alfred Booth, to take some leave, due to the stress of captaining the ship in U-boat-infested sea lanes, and for his protestations that the ship should not become an armed merchant cruiser, making her a prime target for German forces. Turner tried to calm the passengers by explaining that the ship's speed made her safe from attack by submarine. However, Cunard shut down one of the ship's four boiler rooms to reduce costs on sparsely subscribed wartime voyages, 
reducing her top speed from 25.5 to around 22 knots. Lusitania steamed out of New York at noon on the 1st of May, two hours behind schedule, because of a last-minute transfer of 41 passengers and crew from the recently requisitioned Cameronia. Shortly after departure, three German-speaking men were found on board hiding in a steward's pantry. Detective Inspector William Pierpoint of the Liverpool Police, who was traveling in the guise of a first-class passenger, interrogated them before locking them in the cells for further questioning when the ship reached Liverpool. Also among the crew was an Englishman, Neil Leach, who had been working as a tutor in Germany before the war. Leach had been interned but later released by Germany. The German embassy in Washington was notified about Leach's arrival in America, where he met known German agents. Leach and the three German stowaways went down with the ship. They had probably been tasked with spying on Lusitania and her cargo. Most probably, Pierpoint, who survived the sinking, would already have been informed about Leach. As the liner steamed across the ocean, the British Admiralty had been tracking the movements of U-20, commanded by Captain Lieutenant Walther Schwieger, through wireless intercepts and radio direction finding. The submarine left Borkum on the 30th of April, heading northwest across the North Sea. On the 2nd of May, she had reached Peterhead and proceeded around the north of Scotland and Ireland, and then along the western and southern coasts of Ireland to enter the Irish Sea from the south. Although the submarine's departure, destination, and expected arrival time were known to Room 40 in the Admiralty, the activities of the decoding department were considered so secret that they were unknown even to the normal intelligence division which tracked enemy ships or to the trade division responsible for warning merchant vessels. Only the very highest officers in the Admiralty saw the information and passed on warnings only when they felt it essential. On the 27th of March, Room 40 had intercepted a message which clearly demonstrated that the Germans had broken the code used to pass messages to British merchant ships. Cruisers protecting merchant ships were warned not to use the code to give directions to shipping because it could just as easily attract enemy submarines as steering ships away from them. However, Queenstown, now Cove, was not given this warning and continued to give directions in the compromised code which was not changed until after Lusitania's sinking. At this time, the Royal Navy was significantly involved with operations leading up to the landings at Gallipoli, and the intelligence department had been undertaking a program of misinformation to convince Germany to expect an attack on her northern coast. As part of this, ordinary cross-channel traffic to the Netherlands was halted from the 19th of April, and false reports were leaked about troop ship movements from ports on Britain's western and southern coasts. This led to a demand from the German army for offensive action against the expected troop movements, and consequently a surge in German submarine activity on the British west coast. The fleet was warned to expect additional submarines, but this warning was not passed on to those sections of the navy dealing with merchant vessels. The return of the battleship Orion from Devonport to Scotland was delayed until the 4th of May, and she was given orders to stay 100 nautical miles from the Irish coast. On the 5th of May, U-20 stopped a merchant schooner, Earl of Latham, off the old head of Kinsale, examined her papers, then ordered her crew to leave before sinking the schooner with gunfire. On the 6th of May, U-20 fired a torpedo at Cayo Romano, a British steamer originating from Cuba flying a neutral flag off Fastnet Rock, narrowly missing by a few feet. At 22.30 on the 5th of May, the Royal Navy sent an uncoded warning to all ships, Submarines active off the south coast of Ireland, and at midnight an addition was made to the regular nightly warnings, submarine off Fastnet. On the 6th of May, U-20 sank the 6,000-ton steamer candidate. It then failed to get off a shot at the 16,000-ton liner Arabic, because although she kept a straight course, the liner was too fast, but then sank another 6,000-ton British cargo ship flying no flag, Centurion, all in the region of the Koningbeg lightship. The specific mention of a submarine was dropped from the midnight broadcast on 6th to 7th of May as news of the new sinkings had not yet reached the Navy at Queenstown, and it was correctly assumed that there was no longer a submarine at Fastnet. Captain Turner of Lusitania was given a warning message twice on the evening of the 6th of May and took what he felt were prudent precautions. 
That evening, a Seaman's Charities Fund concert took place throughout the ship, and the captain was obliged to attend the event in the first class lounge. At about 11 o'clock on the 7th of May, the Admiralty radioed another warning to all ships, probably as a result of a request by Alfred Booth, who was concerned about Lusitania. U-boats active in southern part of Irish Channel, last heard of 20 miles south of Coningbeg light vessel. Booth and all of Liverpool had received news of the sinkings, which the Admiralty had known about by at least 3 o'clock that morning. Turner adjusted his heading northeast, not knowing that this report related to events of the previous day and apparently thinking submarines would be more likely to keep to the open sea so that Lusitania would be safer close to land. At 1300 another message was received, submarine 5 miles south of Cape Clear proceeding west when sighted at 10 a.m. This report was inaccurate as no submarine had been at that location, but gave the impression that at least one submarine had been safely passed. U-20 was low on fuel and had only three torpedoes left. On the morning of the 7th of May, visibility was poor and Schwieger decided to head for home. He submerged at 1100 hours after sighting a fishing boat which he believed might be a British patrol and shortly after was passed while still submerged by a ship at high speed. This was the cruiser Juno returning to Queenstown, traveling fast and zigzagging having received warning of submarine activity off Queenstown at 0745. The Admiralty considered these old cruisers highly vulnerable to submarines, and indeed, Schwieger attempted to target the ship. On the morning of the 6th of May, Lusitania was 750 nautical miles west of southern Ireland. By 0500 on the 7th of May, she reached a point 120 nautical miles west-southwest of Fastnet Rock, off the southern tip of Ireland, where she met the patrolling boarding vessel Partridge. By 0600, heavy fog had arrived and extra lookouts were posted. As the ship came closer to Ireland, Captain Turner ordered depth soundings to be made, and at 0800 for speed to be reduced to 18 knots, then to 15 knots and for the foghorn to be sounded. Some of the passengers were disturbed that the ship appeared to be advertising her presence. By 10 hundred hours the fog began to lift. By noon it had been replaced by bright sunshine over a clear smooth sea and speed increased to 18 knots. U-20 surfaced again at 12.45 as visibility was now excellent. At 13.20 something was sighted and Schwieger was summoned to the conning tower. At first it appeared to be several ships because of the number of funnels and masts, but this resolved into one large steamer appearing over the horizon. At 13.25, the submarine submerged to periscope depth of 11 meters and set a course to intercept the liner at her maximum submerged speed of 9 knots. When the ships had closed to 2 nautical miles, Lusitania turned away. Schwieger feared he had lost his target, but she turned again, this time onto a near ideal course to bring her into position for an attack. At 14.10, with the target at 700 meters range, he ordered one gyroscopic torpedo to be fired, set to run at a depth of 3 meters. In Schwieger's own words, recorded in the log of U-20, torpedo hits starboard side right behind the bridge. An unusually heavy detonation takes place with a very strong explosive cloud. The explosion of the torpedo must have been followed by a second one. Boiler or coal or powder? The ship stops immediately and heels over to starboard very quickly. Immersing simultaneously at the bow, the name Lusitania becomes visible in golden letters. U-20's torpedo officer, Raymond Weisbach, viewed the destruction through the vessel's periscope and felt the explosion was unusually severe. Within six minutes, Lusitania's forecastle began to submerge. Though Schwieger states the torpedo hit beneath the bridge, survivor testimony, including that of Captain Turner, gave a number of different locations. Some stated it was between the first and second funnels, others between the third and fourth, and one claimed it struck below the capstan. On board the Lusitania, Leslie Morton, an 18-year-old lookout at the bow, had spotted thin lines of foam racing toward the ship. He shouted, Torpedoes coming on the starboard side, through a megaphone, thinking the bubbles came from two projectiles, not one. The torpedo struck Lusitania under the bridge, sending a plume of debris, steel plating, and water upward and knocking lifeboat number 5 off its davits. It sounded like a million-ton hammer hitting a steam boiler a hundred feet high. 
one passenger said. A second more powerful explosion followed, sending a geyser of water, coal, dust, and debris high above the deck. Schwieger's log entries attest that he launched only one torpedo. Some doubt the validity of this claim, contending that the German government subsequently altered the published fair copy of Schwieger's log, but accounts from other U-20 crew members corroborate it. The entries were also consistent with intercepted radio reports sent to Germany by U-20 once she had returned to the North Sea before any possibility of an official cover-up. At 1412, Captain Turner ordered Quartermaster Johnston stationed at the ship's wheel to steer hard a starboard towards the Irish coast, which Johnston confirmed, but the ship could not be steadied on the course and rapidly ceased to respond to the wheel. Turner signaled for the engines to be reversed to halt the ship, but although the signal was received in the engine room, nothing could be done. Steam pressure had collapsed from 195 psi before the explosion to 50 psi and falling afterwards. Lusitania's wireless operator sent out an immediate SOS, which was acknowledged by a coastal wireless station. Shortly afterward, he transmitted the ship's position 10 nautical miles south of the old head of Kinsale. At 1414, electrical power failed, plunging the cavernous interior of the ship into darkness. Radio signals continued on emergency batteries, but electric lifts failed, trapping crew members in the forward cargo hold who had been preparing luggage to go ashore at Liverpool later that evening. It was these seamen precisely who were to report to muster stations to launch lifeboats in the event of a sinking. Bulkhead doors that were closed as a precaution before the attack could not be reopened to release trapped men. The rudder became inoperable with the loss of power as well, meaning the ship could not be steered to counteract the list or to beach herself. Few testimonies report passengers trapped in the two central elevators though one saloon passenger claimed to have seen the lift stuck between the boat deck while passing through the first-class entrance. About one minute after the electrical power failed, Captain Turner gave the order to abandon ship. Water had flooded the ship's starboard longitudinal compartments, causing a 15-degree list to starboard. Lusitania's severe starboard list complicated the launch of her lifeboats. Ten minutes after the torpedo struck, when she had slowed enough to start putting boats in the water, the lifeboats on the starboard side swung out too far to step aboard safely. While it was still possible to board the lifeboats on the port side, lowering them presented a different problem. As was typical for the period, the hull plates of Lusitania were riveted, and as the lifeboats were lowered they dragged on the inch-high rivets, which threatened to seriously damage the boats before they landed in the water. Many lifeboats overturned while loading or lowering, spilling passengers into the sea and others were overturned by the ship's motion when they hit the water. It has been claimed that some boats, because of the negligence of some officers, crashed down onto the deck, crushing other passengers and sliding down towards the bridge. This has been disputed by passenger and crew testimony. Some untrained crewmen would lose their grip on ropes used to lower the lifeboats while trying to lower the boats into the ocean, and this caused the passengers to spill into the sea. Others tipped on launch as some panicking people jumped into the boat. Lusitania had 48 lifeboats, more than enough for all the crew and passengers, but only six were successfully lowered, all from the starboard side. Lifeboat 1 overturned as it was being lowered, spilling its original occupants into the sea but it managed to right itself shortly afterwards and was later filled with people from in the water. Lifeboats 9, 5 people on board, and 11, 7 people on board, managed to reach the water safely with a few people, but both later picked up many swimmers. Lifeboats 13 and 15 also safely reached the water, overloaded with around 150 people. Finally, lifeboat 21, 52 people on board, reached the water safely and cleared the ship moments before her final plunge. A few of her collapsible lifeboats washed off her decks as she sank and provided flotation for some survivors. Two lifeboats on the port side cleared the ship as well. Lifeboat 14, 11 people on board, was lowered and launched safely, but because the boat plug was not in place, it filled with seawater and sank almost immediately after reaching the water. Later, lifeboat 2 floated away from the ship with new occupants its previous ones having been spilled into the sea when they upset the boat, after they removed a rope and one of the ship's tentacle-like funnel stays. They rowed away shortly before the ship sank. There was panic and disorder on the decks. 
Schwieger had been observing this through U-20's periscope, and by 1425 he dropped the periscope and headed out to sea. Later in the war, Schwieger was killed in action when, as he commanded U-88, the vessel struck a British mine and sank on the 5th of September 1917, north of Terschelling. There were no survivors from U-88 sinking. Captain Turner was on the deck near the bridge clutching the ship's logbook and charts when a wave swept upward towards the bridge and the rest of the ship's forward superstructure, knocking him overboard into the sea. He managed to swim and find a chair floating in the water which he clung to. He survived, having been pulled unconscious from the water after spending three hours there. Lusitania's bow slammed into the bottom about 100 meters or 330 feet below at a shallow angle because of her forward momentum as she sank. Along the way, some boilers exploded. As he had taken the ship's logbook and charts with him, Turner's last navigational fix had been only two minutes before the torpedoing, and he was able to remember the ship's speed and bearing at the moment of the sinking. This was accurate enough to locate the wreck after the war. The ship traveled about two nautical miles from the time of the torpedoing to her final resting place, leaving a trail of debris and people behind. After her bow sank completely, Lusitania's stern rose out of the water, enough for her propellers to be seen, and went under. None of the four funnels collapsed, although some survivors testified that the third funnel swung and struck their lifeboat as they boarded it. Lusitania sank in only 18 minutes, at a distance of 11.5 nautical miles off the old head of Kinsale. Despite being relatively close to shore, it took several hours for help to arrive from the Irish coast. By the time help arrived, however, many in the 52 degrees Fahrenheit or 11 degrees Celsius water had succumbed to the cold. By the day's end, 764 passengers and crew from Lusitania had been rescued and landed at Queenstown. The final death toll for the disaster came to a catastrophic number. Of the 1,959 passengers and crew aboard Lusitania at the time of her sinking, 1,195 had been lost. In the days following the disaster, the Cunard Line offered local fishermen and sea merchants a cash reward for the bodies floating all throughout the Irish Sea, some floating as far away as the Welsh coast. Only 289 bodies were recovered, 65 of which were never identified. The bodies of many of the victims were buried at either Queenstown, where 148 bodies were interred in the Old Church Cemetery, or the Church of St. Maltos in Kinsale, but the bodies of the remaining 885 victims were never recovered. Two days before, U-20 had sunk Earl of Latham, but first allowed the crew to escape in boats. According to international maritime law, any military vessel stopping an unarmed civilian ship was required to allow those on board time to escape before sinking it. The conventions had been drawn up in a time before the invention of the submarine and took no account of the severe risk a small vessel, such as a submarine, faced if it gave up the advantage of a surprise attack. Schwieger could have allowed the crew and passengers of Lusitania to take to the boats, but he considered the danger of being rammed or fired upon by deck guns too great. Merchant ships had, in fact, been advised to steer directly at any U-boat that surfaced. A cash bonus had been offered for any that were sunk, though the advice was carefully worded so as not to amount to an order to ram. This feat would be accomplished only once during the war by a commercial vessel, when in 1918 the White Star liner HMT Olympic, sister ship to the Titanic, rammed SMU-103 in the English Channel, sinking the submarine. According to Bailey and Ryan, Lusitania was traveling without any flag and her name painted over with darkish dye. One story, an urban legend, states that when Lieutenant Schwieger of U-20 gave the order to fire, his quartermaster, Charles Vogel, would not take part in an attack on women and children and refused to pass on the order to the torpedo room, a decision for which he was court-martialed and imprisoned at Kiel until the end of the war. This rumor persisted from 1972, when the French daily paper Le Monde published a letter to the editor. Despite seemingly putting an end to this rumor, Vogel's alleged hesitation was depicted in the torpedoing scene of the 2007 docudrama Sinking of the Lusitania, Terror at Sea. Many witnesses testified that portholes across the ship had been open at the time of the sinking, and an expert witness confirmed that such a porthole three feet underwater would let in four tons of water per minute. Testimony varied on how many torpedoes there had been, and whether the strike occurred between the first and second funnel, or third and fourth. The nature of the official cargo was considered, 
but experts considered that under no conditions could the cargo have exploded. The sinking caused an international outcry, especially in Britain and across the British Empire, as well as in the United States, since 128 out of 139 U.S. citizens aboard the ship lost their lives. On the 8th of May, Bernhard Dernberg, a German spokesman and a former German colonial secretary, published a statement in which he said that because Lusitania carried contraband of war, and also because she was classed as an auxiliary cruiser, Germany had a right to destroy her regardless of any passengers aboard. Dernberg claimed warnings given by the German embassy before the sailing plus the 18th of February note declaring the existence of war zones relieved Germany of any responsibility for the deaths of American citizens aboard. He referred to the ammunition and military goods declared on Lusitania's manifest and said that vessels of that kind could be seized and destroyed under the Hague rules. Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz stated it was sad that many Americans, in wanton recklessness and in spite of the warnings of our ambassador, had embarked in this armed cruiser heavily laden with munitions and had died, but that Germany had been within her rights to sink the ship. Lusitania was indeed officially listed as an auxiliary warship, though contrary to Tirpitz's assertion she was not armed, and her cargo had included an estimated 4.2 million rounds of rifle cartridges 1,250 empty shell cases, and 18 cases of non-explosive fuses, which was openly listed as such in her cargo manifest. The day after the sinking, the New York Times published full details of the ship's military cargo. Assistant manager of the Cunard Line, Herman Winter, denied the charge that she carried munitions, but admitted that she was carrying small arms ammunition, and that she had been carrying such ammunition for years. The fact that Lusitania had been carrying shells and cartridges was not made known to the British public at the time. In the 27-page additional manifest, delivered to U.S. Customs four to five days after Lusitania sailed from New York, and in the Bethlehem Steel's papers, it is stated that the empty shells were in fact 1,248 boxes of filled with metal shrapnel, three-inch shell, four shells to the box, totaling 103,000 pounds or 50 tons. In the United States, public opinion was outraged. War talk was rife and pro-German elements kept quiet. The key issue was the savagery and the German failure to allow passengers to escape on lifeboats as required by international law. President Woodrow Wilson refused to immediately declare war. His main goal was to negotiate an end to the war. During the weeks after the sinking, the issue was hotly debated within the U.S. government and correspondence was exchanged between the U.S. and German governments. German Foreign Minister von Jago continued to argue that Lusitania was a legitimate military target. As she was listed as an armed merchant cruiser, she was using neutral flags and she had been ordered to ram submarines, in blatant contravention of the cruiser rules. Von Jago further argued that Lusitania had on previous voyages carried munitions and allied troops. Wilson continued to insist the German government apologize for the sinking, compensate U.S. victims, and promise to avoid any similar occurrence in the future. The British were disappointed with Wilson over his failure to pursue more drastic actions. Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan advised President Wilson that ships carrying contraband should be prohibited from carrying passengers. It would be like putting women and children in front of an army. Bryan later resigned because he felt the Wilson administration was being biased in ignoring British contraventions of international law, and that Wilson was leading the U.S. into the war. A German decision on the 9th of September 1915 stated that attacks were only allowed on ships that were definitely British, while neutral ships were to be treated under the prize law rules, and no attacks on passenger liners were to be permitted at all. A fabricated story was circulated that in some regions of Germany, school children were given a holiday to celebrate the sinking of Lusitania. This claim was so effective that James W. Gerard, the U.S. ambassador to Germany, recounted it in his memoir of his time in Germany, face to face with Kaiserism, though without substantiating its validity. Almost two years later, in January 1917, the German government announced it would again conduct full unrestricted submarine warfare. 
This together with the Zimmerman telegram pushed U.S. public opinion over the tipping point, and on the 6th of April 1917, the United States Congress followed President Wilson's request to declare war on Germany. In 2014, a release of papers revealed that in 1982, the British government warned salvage divers of the possible presence of explosives on board. Senior diplomat Noel Marshall wrote in a memo that, Successive British governments have always maintained that there was no munitions on board the Lusitania, and that the Germans were therefore in the wrong to claim to the contrary as an excuse for sinking the ship. The facts are that there is a large amount of ammunition in the wreck, some of which is highly dangerous. After a search of records, the Ministry of Defense said they could find no evidence to substantiate the rumors of a secret munition store, and the internal inquiry concluded that the Lusitania was not carrying any explosives or any special ammunition. But it was still felt to be prudent to warn the salvage company of the obvious but real danger inherent if explosives did happen to be present. Accepting that always been public knowledge that the Lusitania's cargo included some 5,000 cases of small arms ammunition. No explosives were found by the salvage company. There has long been a theory expressed by historian and former British naval intelligence officer Patrick Beasley and authors Colin Simpson and Donald E. Schmidt, among others, that Lusitania was deliberately placed in danger by the British authorities, so as to entice a U-boat attack and thereby drag the U.S. into the war on the side of Britain. A week before the sinking of Lusitania, Winston Churchill wrote to Walter Runciman, the president of the Board of Trade, stating that it is most important to attract neutral shipping to our shores, in the hope especially of embroiling the United States with Germany. Beasley concludes, Unless and until fresh information comes to light, I am reluctantly driven to the conclusion that there was a conspiracy deliberately to put Lusitania at risk in the hope that even an abortive attack on her would bring the United States into the war. Such a conspiracy could not have been put into effect without Winston Churchill's express permission and approval. At the post-sinking inquiry, Captain Turner refused to answer certain questions on the grounds of wartime secrecy imperatives. The British government continues to keep secret certain documents relating to the final days of the voyage, including certain of the signals passed between the Admiralty and Lusitania. The records that are available are often missing critical pages, and lingering questions include the following. Were the British authorities aware, thanks to the secret decryption activities of Room 40, that a German submarine was in the path of Lusitania, but failed to divert the ship to a safer route? Did they also fail to provide a destroyer escort, although destroyers were available in a nearby port? Was the ship ordered to reduce speed in the war zone, for reasons that have been kept secret ever since? How did such a big ship sink so quickly from a single torpedo strike? Lusitania was officially carrying among her cargo 4,200 cases of rifle-slash-machine-gun ammunition, 1,250 cases of empty shrapnel artillery shells, and the artillery fuses for those shells stored separately. This comprised a total of 173 tons. In September 2008, .303 cartridges were recovered from the wreck by diver Eowyn McGarry. Additional declared material could be used for military purposes. Beasley has stated that the cargo also included 46 tons of aluminium powder, which was used in the manufacture of explosives and which was being shipped to the Woolwich Arsenal while Eric Larson has stated that the cargo included 50 barrels and 94 cases of aluminum powder, as well as 50 cases of bronze powder. Furthermore, there are 90 tons of butter and lard destined for the Royal Navy Weapons Testing Establishment in Essex. Although it was May, this lard and butter was not refrigerated. It was insured by the special government rate, but the insurance was never claimed. Overall, these supplies represented around a third of the declared financial value of the cargo aboard the ship, but a relatively small volume of cargo on the ship. The passenger ship was also not an efficient cargo carrier, as much smaller dedicated vessels could carry far more cargo. For example, the SS Mont Blanc involved in the Halifax explosion could carry almost 3,000 tons of materials despite being a tenth the size. It also may be noted that the British War Office considered the majority of U.S. manufactured ammunition in this period to be of poor quality and so suitable for emergency use only. 
and in any case incapable of supplying consumption of over 5 million rounds per day. American ammunition contracts were cancelled in 1916. Some authors speculate on the presence of undeclared munitions. Author Stephen L. Danver alleges that Lusitania was also secretly carrying a large quantity of nitrocellulose, gun cotton. Additional speculation centered on a consignment of furs sent from Dupont de Nemours, a company that also manufactured explosives, though such furs were reported to have washed ashore in Ireland. Other authors have suggested that the shells were in fact live, which would mean that around five tons of cordite was on board. No evidence of additional secret explosives have so far been found. The wreck was depth charged or attacked with hedgehog mortars by the Royal Navy during World War II. A Dublin-based technical diver, Des Quigley, who dived on the wreck in the 1990s, reported that the wreck is like Swiss cheese, and the seabed around her is littered with unexploded hedgehog mines. These attacks may have been accidental as the wreck would have registered on World War II active sonar, then known as ASDIC, as a possible U-boat. World War II systems were not as discriminating as modern sonar. The wreck would have presented a good return signal and thus, a tempting target. U-boats were so active in the Southern Irish Sea in World War II that Britain eventually placed several deep minefields in the area, at depths where only submarines would have been liable to detonate them. In February 2009, the Discovery Channel television series Treasure Quest aired an episode titled Lusitania Revealed, in which Greg Bemis, a retired venture capitalist who owns the rights to the wreck, and a team of shipwreck experts explore the wreck via a remote control unmanned submersible. At one point in the documentary, an unexploded depth charge was found in the wreckage. Professor William Kingston of Trinity College, Dublin, claimed, There's no doubt at all about it that the Royal Navy and the British government have taken very considerable steps over the years to try to prevent whatever can be found out about the Lusitania. The wreck of Lusitania was located on the 6th of October, 1935, 11 miles south of the lighthouse at Kinsale. It lies on its starboard side at an approximately 30 degree angle in roughly 305 feet or 93 meters of water. The wreck is badly collapsed onto its starboard side due to the force with which it struck the bottom coupled with the forces of winter tides and corrosion in the decades since the sinking. The keel has an unusual curvature which may be related to a lack of strength from the loss of its superstructure. The beam is reduced with the funnels missing, presumably due to deterioration. Some of the prominent features on Lusitania include her still legible name, some bollards with the rope still intact, pieces of the ruined promenade deck, some portholes, the prow, and the remaining propeller. The bow is the most prominent portion of the wreck with the stern damaged by depth charges. Three of the four propellers were removed by Oceaneering International in 1982 for display, though one was melted down. Expeditions to Lusitania have shown that the ship has deteriorated much faster than Titanic has, being in a depth of 305 feet or 93 meters of water. When contrasted with her contemporary, Titanic, resting at a depth of 12,000 feet or 3,700 meters, Lusitania appears in a much more deteriorated state due to the presence of fishing nets lying on the wreckage, the blasting of the wreck with depth charges and multiple salvage operations. As a result, the wreck is unstable and may at some point completely collapse. There has been recent academic commentary exploring the possibility of listing the wreck site as a World Heritage Site under the World Heritage Convention, although challenges remain in terms of ownership and preventing further deterioration of the wreck. Argument over whether the ship was a legitimate military target raged back and forth throughout the war, and continues to this very day. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.